Hello, thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video. Thank you for accepting the invitation to join the Wayne State University School of Medicine, Department of Internal Medicine and Race-Based Medicine Task Force. This video is being created to provide an orientation, provide background and context for the creation of this task, for task force and our mandate and how to move forward. Again, thank you. We will not be able to meet these goals without you. You are everything in terms of achieving the goals of this task force. And so the title of this presentation is End Race-Based Medicine, The Time Is Now. My name again is Dr. Ijeoma Nodimopara, Internal Medicine and Pediatrics. And I am the founding director of Health Equity and Justice in Medicine program here at Wayne State and the DMC. And I am honored to serve along with my colleague and peer mentor, Dr. Latanya Riddle-Jones as co-chair of the End Race-Based Medicine Task Force. And so this presentation again is to orient and provide context and background. So let's get into it, why don't we? As always, we like to start with acknowledging the land and our ancestors. And so acknowledging this land is the land of the Anishinaabe and Three Fires people, Jibwe Odawa and Botawatomi. This is the territory unceded called Wa'awiyatanong or Detroit. And acknowledging the history of genocide and forced removal from this territory and committing to be better stewards of this land along with the indigenous people that live here and are still connected here. And of course, my ancestors, my African, Igbo, Nigerian, and diaspora ancestors, I honor and acknowledge because they made it possible for me to be today, exist, thrive as a free Black African woman. There's six keys that guide this conversation today and really need to sort of anchor the work that we do as a task force. So the first key is really internalizing this so that it can motivate and inspire and energize us for the work that is to come. And that is to really internalize that race is a sociopolitical cultural construct for economic purposes and not a biological category. The second key is that racism is the vector of disease and disparities, not race. Third key is that race is not ancestry. Race is not genetic, it's not biological. Fourth key is that racial health and wealth disparities are not accidental, but intentional and by design. The fifth key is that race-based medicine is racist and continuing to practice it is medical malpractice. And the sixth key, and this is key, is that we can do better and we will do better because we are better. And we will do this because now we know better. So I want to start with the case, the case of the mysterious, mysterious case of chronic pain. We have a 32-year-old man who looks exactly like this, who presents with severe chronic intermittent pain, mostly in his lower back, arms, and legs. It's excruciatingly, excruciatingly worse in the cold. And when he's stressed or dehydrated, and it's very debilitating, he has undergone extensive comprehensive medical evaluation with no positive findings. This is based on a true story. And so this young man who has been suffering with this chronic intermittent pain most of his life, if not practically all his life, had gone undiagnosed for a long time until somebody who was, I would say, anti-racist, someone who was liberated from race-based medicine and race science, diagnosed him with sickle cell disease. As you already know what sickle cell disease is, where normal red blood cells um, become or are, have, there's a genetic mutation that results in, instead of having normal red blood cells, a varying amount of sickle cells that clog up the blood vessels, causing ischemia, pain, debilitating life, a lot of, uh, coma, of, of morbidity and early or premature mortality. This young man was misdiagnosed because he presented as white in North America. And by presenting as white, the thought was that there's no way he could have sickle cell. Now, what we know is that sickle cell really evolved as an evolutionary mutation, right? Adaptation, shall we say, among people who lived where the Anopheles uh, mosquito lives 
um, and therefore protected them uh, against malaria. So it's not because of skin color because phenotype is not genotype, but that rather folks that lived in West Africa, the Mediterranean, so Europe, Middle East, South Asia, wherever you could get malaria was where you found the sickle cell mutation and folks that carry the trait or had the disease if they had both gene, gene, gene alleles um, that which they inherited from their parents. And so this young man is actually from Italian and he's from the Mediterranean and he had sickle cell disease, sickle cell anemia. And so when he was finally um, diagnosed and, and, and got the treatment that he needed uh, was when he got relief. But think about the 32 years of unnecessary pain and suffering because of the racialization of disease. Another case, the mysteri mysterious case of chronic pneumonia, eight-year-old girl presented with acute episodes of recurrent pneumonia, again, based on true story. Since she was a baby, only partially responding to antibiotics, she's small for her age, she has learning difficulties, undergone extensive comprehensive medical eval, no clear diagnosis, child protective services has been activated for suspected neglect, Parents are a hot mess at this point. They just are at their wits end. They have other children. They have work that that is always uh, is re is repeatedly interrupted. It just has really been extremely disrupted to disruptive to their life and quality of life. And the 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 babies, uh, the girls team is scratching their heads and not knowing what to do. It wasn't until a doctor was walking by the room where they had hung up her chest x-ray, this, this being an example of it, not it, it precisely, but looking just like this, um, while they scratch it, what is going on with this kid? A doctor, a random doctor was just minding their business, walking by, looked into the room and saw the x-ray hanging and said, hey, who's the kid with cystic fibrosis? And the team was like, what? They never considered cystic fibrosis in their differential because this is what the girl looked like. And so because she had beautiful brown melanated skin, they never considered because cystic fibrosis is a genetic disorder of quote unquote whites, right? These are extremely intelligent, very smart people, but they had been taught and conditioned and learned how to racialize disease, how to pathologize blackness. And so, the truth of the matter, and so of course this young girl, eventually she got tested for cystic fibrosis, it was positive and she got the treatment that she needed, but she had suffered remarkable complications and her family had suffered. And of course, you talk about the intersectionality of oppression of violence, uh, racialized oppression of violence, where you have CPS now involved, you know that um, families of color are usually, uh, CPS is usually called more, or the government, the system is usually activated more. And certainly this is true when it comes to child protective services um, in families of color and in black families spe spe specifically. And, um, and when that happens, usually a negative outcome is, is assured, is guaranteed. Um, fa black families are usually tend, tended to be separated from their children more often than not once the system gets involved. Um, it's not, it, it is a form you know, of violence. And the whole time, because the team had racialized disease, had, was practicing race-based medicine and science, and they had subjected um, um, this child and her family to incredible suffering. Um, it, this, is, this is not acceptable. And so I would like you to sit and think in your practice, in your training and in your teaching and in whatever work that you do in the space, you do it, knowing that not everyone is a physician or necessarily in healthcare, but do you correct for race or incorporate race, um, either A, in clinical algorithms or in your risk assessment as a risk factor, B, in uh, estimating or assessing organ function like the EGFR for renal function, uh, pulmonary function tests for lung function, C, therapeutics for hypertension, heart failure, case presentations, D, a uh, 35-year-old black man walks in, do you do that? Or maybe all of the above, none of the above, or some other piece. In what ways uh, do you integrate or incorporate race in your work and, and how do you do that? And more importantly, why do you do that? For what purpose, what function is it fulfilling necessarily?
And so what is race-based medicine? It is the practice of medicine and other forms of healthcare. You have race-based nursing, race-based pharmacy, race-based social work, race-based PTOT, and the list goes on. So really, we're talking about race-based healthcare that is grounded in racial essentialism. That is the belief that races are biologically distinct groups and are determined by genes. It's a key component in race of racism in medicine. And this belief has perpetuated generations of harm. And I'm, I'm making reference to resources and sharing resources for you all to hopefully populate your libraries with. And so this book by the amazing Dr. Graves, Racism Not Race, Answers to Frequently Asked Questions, starts to help unpack this. It's important to note that there is, there is no scientific basis for race-based medicine, yet it has lingered along with many other racist ideas in U.S. health policies, research design, and clinical practices. And the question is why? Why? Why do you think? Why do you think that race-based medicine has persisted since slavery, since the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, surviving seismic changes in medical knowledge, technology, and ethics? Why? We learn from the amazing, phenomenal Dr. Dorothy Roberts of Fatal Invention, Killing the Black Body, and a new, just a whole litany of books by all her stuff, that race is not a biological category that is politically charged. No, it is a political category that has been disguised as a biological one. In fact, it is the delusion that race is a biological inheritance rather than a political relationship that leads plenty of intelligent people to make the most ludicrous statements about Black biological traits. Race indeed is a social construct used to group people based on physical characteristics behavioral patterns and geographic location. But the fact of the matter is that these categories are broad, they are poorly defined, and they vary by country and they change over time. We know that groups that sued to become quote unquote white, Latinx groups that sued to become white, Middle Eastern groups that sued to become white. These categories are political. They are created in the courts. They are not biological. And to use them as such is ludicrous. And we have the four horsemen and, and some more and women um, to, to thank for, for this gift, the gift of scientific racism that underpins race-based medicine, by which research characterizing race as essential and biological translates into clinical practice leading to disparities, leading to uh, inequities, uh, producing injustice. Medicine is not a standalone institution. Healthcare is not a standalone institution immune to racial injustice, but itself is a progeny, a product, a reflection, and a perpetrator of structural racism, injustice, oppression, and violence. And because when we presume biological distinction ultimately is in service of a hierarchical uh, uh, society or organization of society, Right, a racial hierarchy uh, of superior and all the way down to inferior, and it it is it is organized in a way that white is superior, black is inferior, and everyone else can fall in between somewhere. And so, these four horsemen is Samuel Cartwright of Drapetomania fame. You got Charles Darwin of the Origins of Man and the uh, uh, and the uh, evolution of the races. Um, you have uh, Charles Morton, of course, and Carl Linnaeus. And these are all the European men and American who uh, determined that they will sit down in their armchair and organize the world with them on top and everybody else below and establish it as a discipline and as a, an, an epistemology that will carry over to, for centuries to today, 2023. And so we wrote a little bit about this in my in our paper, Modern Day of Drapetomania, Calling Out Scientific Racism. Please feel free to search for it and read. But understanding that physicians played a role in the invention and then the 
codification of race in order to implement racism, maintain slavery, uphold white supremacism and anti-blackness and hoard economic and political power among people racialized as white. And these are some resources. If you don't have this in your library, get this in your library. Medical Appetite, 1619 Project Superior, Medicalizing Blackness, Maladies of Empire. These are critical uh, 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 components of, of anyone who is doing health equity, equity, equity work. And frankly, anyone engaging with people in their library. And so what does this do? What is the impact? What is this in service of? What is this the function for? Now, the ultimate goal is economic uh, um, power, economic and political power among those that racialize themselves as white. However, in order to do that, you must dehumanize those that you have racialized as black in order to therefore move forward towards exploiting exploiting them for free labor for centuries and destroying them when you don't have any need for them, which happened after civil war with emancipation and when black labor was no longer um, of value and therefore black bodies were no longer of value. And so you have your lynching. And then you have, of course, the way you treated property because they're not human, right? I mean, science said so, right? So yeah, when they run away, you whip them like this gentleman, right? Um, and there's a movie now made after his story called Emancipation starring Will Smith. Um, when you don't need them anymore, you hang them, you lynch them, you shoot them, you kill them, uh, you experiment on them. So this is a picture of Marion Sims with who we believe to be um, Annika or Lucy or Betsy, but one of the enslaved African women uh, who he experimented on without um, sedation. He did do work on white women, but he sedated them. He anesthetized them, but not enslaved African women. And whose bodies uh, produce for us the obstetrical techniques and advancements that we all benefit from. And this is just one example of many ways that enslaved African bodies were used to develop the, not just bodies, but also minds. Because keep in mind that these enslaved Africans were themselves scientists and doctors and professionals and, 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 and farmers and, 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 and innovators where they were stolen from. So they also brought knowledge to uh, the, col the colonies as well. Um, in fact, we get immunization from variolation that we, we believe, we know from the uh, evidence we have to have been introduced to uh, North America by an enslaved African that we call Onesimus. Um, and so, so these are the ways, these are the ways. And of course, you're familiar with this picture, uh, which is the United States Public Health Service study on untreated syphilis in the, uh, in the Negro male um, at Tuskegee and whereby um, black men uh, were, 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 were just observed to, to, to learn how the course of syphilis, even though there was treatment for, for syphilis at the time. You do that because these are not humans and these are not humans because science, the science that was created, you know, what we know is pseudoscience said so. They're different fundamentally from white bodies. So not the same, less not human. We see this show up in criminalization of black bodies. So America's war on drugs, police violence, all these are examples. Um, uh, we know what happened in the 80s with the crack epidemic in pre predominantly uh, black communities. And we see what is happening with the opioid epidemic and the difference of, of, of approach, the narratives and the humanization of these children and folks that are suffering from the opioid ep ep epidemic. These, you know, nice white folks that, that are beaten by economic um, challenge and, and mental health challenges, right? Versus the criminals and animals of that among crack, right? So we see the differences in the narratives and what that constructs in the, um, the national imagination to inform what kind of resources are alloc allocated or, or divested or removed uh, from different communities according to how we have placed value on those lives, right? What lives matter? Because we have been taught and indoctrinated into the idea that Black is 
not human like us. Eugenics, the getting rid of undesirables, right, from, from society. This was state-sponsored eugenics. <laughs> These were on the books in the law. In fact, the state of Michigan was the first in, eight, in 1897, the first state in, 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 in what is now the United States of America to propose, um, uh, bring forth eugenics law. Uh, it was not passed. 1907, Iowa was the first to pass eugenics law, uh, but they didn't give up in Michigan. It kept coming back and eventually did pass and then later pulled for being on the Constitution. Then it came back later. So eugenics, this belief that certain people are less than you. If you have disabilities, you're uh, immigrant, you're black, you're brown, you're indigenous, um, et cetera, you don't, you're not human. You don't deserve to reproduce. Let's end your line. Um, and to have it be, you know, so forced sterilization and understanding that Nazi Germany learned this stuff from Americans, from white Americans. Um, it carries a lot. And um, American physicians, American medicine, European medicine as well, and science was very, very instrumental in, um, in, in facilitating these realities. Again, when you are dehumanizing a group of people, you segregate them, you, you separate them from you. So Jim Crow, redlining in housing, healthcare, technology, um, environment, medical, appetite, appetite of, of everything, reproductive injustice, voter suppression, genocide, all is possible because you're not dealing with people, you're not dealing with humans, right? They are less than. And, and that's how it shows up. And so we know that people assigned to the same racial category do not necessarily share the same genetic ancestry. Therefore, there are no underlying genetic or biological factors that unite people within the same racial and racialized, I would say, category. So Africa is the land of with the largest genetic diversity, just biodiversity, not just humans, everything. And, and of course, that's where we came from as humans, right? And so incredible genetic di diversity. Um, and again, you the, there's more genetic commonality between people from different racialized categories than people within the same racialized category because one doesn't have anything to do with the other, right? And then also this idea of, of, of conflating race and ancestry erases the history of genetic admixture especially in the Americas, which was significantly driven and, and, and determined by the systemic and systematic rape of enslaved African women by white male slave holders. Um, and, and again, the Human Genome Project uh, tells us that we are 99.9% .9 alike. And so how is race currently being used in medicine? Well, evaluation and management, so di di generating differential diagnosis, clinical algorithms, uh, race correction formulas, multiple interventions, treatment and counseling and research, technology, resource allocation, the proxies and assumptions. And you wanna watch the problem with race-based medicine by Dorothy Roberts to really have a beautiful <laughs> breakdown of this as well. And so bias and discrimination occurs naturally, right? The ways in which just example with the two cases we just heard about disease stereotyping. If you're 40 years old and a woman and you have perihyalin lymph nodes, it's sarcoidosis until otherwise not proven. Um, so clinical algorithms, tools, guidelines, and race-based pharmacological prescribing then make their way into the system, right? And so this is a landmark paper hidden in plain sight, reconsidering the use of race correction and clinical algorithms. That really does a great job of outlining that and the Lancet paper moving from race-based to race-conscious medicine, really does a great job of outlining the various ways in which race shows up in the calculations that we make in our clinical reasoning and decision-making um, that, again, only serve to contribute to drive, produce disparities. Neuropsychology, and you all know about the story with NFL, finally, finally, uh, how we're being held accountable for the racist practice of race norming, race correction, race adjustment, same thing, practicing race-based neuropsychology to determine uh, if their players that 
that suffered injury and have dementia after playing will get compensation or not. NFL is, is about 70% black. And yet the white players were getting two to three times compensation than their black brothers. And because the calculator that is used, the tool that is used places black, uh, places the cognitive function of black players, black people, lower than that of the cognitive function of white, just like that, just like that. So the, 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 the harm or the injury that black players suffered was not considered as, as significant because after all, you're starting from a lower place. You were anyway brain damaged by just by virtue of being black. So all this is just is nothing, right? It is terrible. And luckily they settled $1 billion. And even then it's, as far as I'm concerned, it's still, um, it's not enough. Um, and so race being used as a biological marker for disease states or a variable in medical diagnosis and treatment obscures the true health status of the patient and leads to health disparities. We see this in pulse oximetry, okay? We see this where Black patients in this study uh, produced 20, last year, Black patients had nearly three times the frequency of occult hypoxemia that was not detected by, by pulse oximetry as white patients. In other words, that Black patients were three times less likely to be properly, positively screened, not, not screened, but positively detected if they had low oxygen levels in their system. So think about how this showed up with COVID and the decisions we were making based on post ox, turning people away, whether to turn them away, discharge them, admit them, keep them, and how that impacted outcomes. In the 60s, Black Americans received increased radiation doses from X-ray machine because X-ray machines were grace corrected on the belief that the skeleton of the Negro is heavier and the bones are thicker. They believe that black people have denser bones, more muscle, thicker skin. So that radiologists and techs use higher radiation exposure during x-ray procedures. Think about the physiologic cost in terms of radiation associated illnesses, cumulative over time, including cancer. And then of course, the psychological cost and physical impact, this, this dehumanization that occurs. So when, this is a side note. So when we talk about reparations, right? It's a conversation. Of course, this is the, another very famous study that showed that 50% of medical trainees believe, really honestly and truly believe that Black people felt less pain. And those people were less likely to provide adequate treatment for, for Black patients. And sometimes we forget that the study also looked at non-medical people. And the beliefs were pretty much in alignment meaning that medical school, healthcare is not the place where you unlearn these uh, racist beliefs. Um, so again, the consequences, delayed diagnosis, misdiagnosis, delayed intervention, lack of close surveillance, misallocation of resources, inappropriate treat, misclassification of disease severity, denied access to life-saving therapy and procedures. Again, with COVID, Despite being 14% of the population in, in Michigan, Black folks accounted for 40% of the COVID deaths at the, height, at, at the beginning of the pandemic. And when we think of the ways in which race-based medicine played a role, it, it, it really breaks the heart. It breaks the heart. And these disparities are spread across all the systems, maternal health, infant health, bone health, blood pressure and cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, lung disease, kidney disease, these disparities based on the belief that difference is biological, racial differences along biological lines. It's, it's, an, it's an immeasurable toll and cost in preventable suffering of Black peoples and Black communities. Um, incredible increased healthcare costs individually, insurance and societal, lost days of work and income, disparities of health, wealth and justice, morbidity and, disabil and disability, and of course, death. So what do we do? What do we do? How do we move away from, 
from race-based medicine? How we, do we de-adopt race-based medicine? How do we adopt um, the, a better way? How do we be, how do we be courageous, bold, and committed really to the policies of 2020? The anti-racist pledges and DEI this and that, right? And so moving towards the abolition of biological race in medicine will require transformation in clinical education, research, and practice. Um, and so there's a call to action, a cry for action that is urgent to eliminate race-based medicine as part of a broader commitment to dismantling the structural and systemic inequities that lead to racial health disparities. And we get this call from the AAP, we get this call in the Lancet, and Joseph L. Wright, Dr. Wright, who is the lead author for the AAP policy statement on eliminating race-based medicine, the American Academy of Pediatrics, states we must acknowledge and address the stark inequities that persist in leaving vulnerable populations behind. We are better than this. Now is the time for change. And we agree. We agree at Wayne State University School of Medicine, Department of Internal, Internal Medicine and Wayne Health, that now indeed is the time and that numero uno, Step is to seize, desist, and divest from race-based medicine and science, period. Because we want to adhere to our oath to first do no harm. And by knowingly continuing race correction or race, practicing race-based medicine or race-based healthcare, that we are committing medical malpractice while perpetuating systemic and institutional racism and producing racial disparities. We are committing harm when we use ill-defined categories of race with inference to biological significance in our research, in our medical education, in our clinical practice. We're committing harm because we are producing and perpetuating uh, racial health inequities, right? And so we need to move from race-based to racism conscious. And this is another famous landmark paper towards that because racism is the vector of disease and disparity is not race. And so this paper, The Art of Medicine Abolish, Abolish Race Correction, I believe was written by Dorothy Roberts, states anti-racism in medicine therefore requires more than weeding out bias in the minds of individual physicians because there's a blossoming of, of implicit bias trainings and God bless implicit bias trainings, but it's not gonna be enough because what is really needed is ending how medicine is structured to promote racist ideas, policies, and practices. I mean, this has continued since the 1800s. Something is wrong in the water, not just the cup we are drinking with. And so getting to a place of healing and justice, reduction in racial health inequities requires racism, conscious medicine, where race is defined as social and, and a power construct in research med ed and clinical practice. That in research, we are looking at the effects of structural racism and analyzing that for racial disparities and different or disparate outcomes among racialized groups. In medical education, we are teaching the consequences of racism on health. In clinical practice, we are, we are providing support to overcome structural barriers to health. And we are divesting of race-based clinical algorithms, et cetera. So many of these organizations, well, these organizations and many more have stood up to be champions of this and doing the work in their respective spheres of influence. Um, a, uh, ASN, NKF National Kidney Foundation, American Society of Nephrology changed their guidelines and removed the race variable in the estimated glomerular filtration rate to calculate rates, um, to calculate renal function or kidney function. Um, uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, removed race from the calculator for urinary tract infection and of course published a policy statement and is organi organizing around this policy statement for eliminating race-based medicine. ACOG, American College of OBGYN, uh, removed uh, the race-based cutoff for iron deficiency anemia in pregnancy, as well as the prediction of vaginal, successful vaginal birth after cesarean delivery calculator and removed that. Uh, but we're still waiting on more folks. We're waiting on um, the uh, folks in, in the cardiology world to revise the atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease calculator and remove it. Um, one of the online calculators for this ASCVD pooled cohort calculator um, has this 
sort of note blurb at the bottom that I found really fascinating. And it says that the pooled cohort equations were developed and validated among Caucasian, and by the way, Caucasian is outdated term, and African-American men and women who did not have clinical ACVD, they are inadequate data in other racial groups such as Hispanics, outdated, um, or nuanced, shall I say, Asians, and American Indian outdated populations. Given the lack of data, the current guidelines suggest to use the quote Caucasian race to estimate 10 year ASCVD risk with the knowledge that further research is needed to stratify these patients risk. This is abominable and unacceptable. What the hell, right? But we accept this without thinking. We don't, we don't critically examine this. This makes sense to many of us, and hopefully it shouldn't and it doesn't. Research, right? Um, numerous papers have come up now with guide, guidance on how do you report on race in research? How do you peer review and how do you serve as an editor? And what? how do you critically analyze uh, the literature um, in ra for race and how you address the, the conclusions. And so um, there's a call, race, ethnicity, disparities, and contextual factors, structural racism, social and structural determinants of, determinants of health, commercial, political determinants of health, environmental, uh, climate determinants of health must be explicitly considered in the studies, design, and interpretation. And that the treatment of race, ethnicity, disparities, and contextual factors must be explicitly and systematically evaluated by reviewers with appropriate expertise emphasis. And the evaluation should be used to fund to, to drive funding or publication decisions. Um, we also have a call to dismantle white normativity, uh, which rests on the definition of whites as the norm or standard for human and everybody else as a deviation from the standard. This is a great book by Ian Haney Lopez, White by Law, the Legal Construction of Race. But really the establishing of white-bodied people as sort of the standard body and physiology and biology, and you compare everything to that needs to like needs to dead, it needs to end. Um, because uh, that is a again a um, re reiter re reification and a uh, reiteration um, of white supremacism, and, and and that that is that should not be anymore. Um, we have tools for critically appraising the use of race in medical research. This is one is called Carmel. It's a meded, and how and really a four point rubric for evaluating the use of race in the in the medical literature how is it is it is race used um is it is it identified as a sociopolitical or biological construct is there internal or external validity and should we apply should we apply it if it's valid or to modify challenge or discard and it's a beautifully laid out process for doing that and that's really important because you get research like this that's published, race, ethnic, and sex differences in the association of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk and healthy lifestyle behaviors. Who concluded after they evaluated, doing, of course, logistical regression analysis, but, you know, uh, the NHANES data to show that race, ethnic minorities are less likely to engage in healthy lifestyle behaviors despite higher BMI and ASCVD risk. So these findings, what do they underscore? The need for culturally sensitive recommendations to improve cardiovascular outcomes in high-risk populations, particularly minority women. This is there's so many things wrong with this conclusion, right? You know, from the fact that it's it seems to blame the culture of quote minority women. When you read the data, it's actually referring to black women. So there's also that piece there, the interchangeability of minority and black, and that's not always the same thing. So again, what are you defining in your racial categories? And race and ethnic is not race slash ethnic. These are two different things. Ethnic groups and racial and racialized groups are different things, but you often will see them used synonymously, inaccurately, inappropriately. So the conclusions don't stand. And then what do culturally sensitive recommendations mean for all, like what does that even mean? And where is the evidence that that has ever actually improved cardiovascular outcomes? And is the assumption therefore for white participants or you know, that they somehow um, are more likely to engage because they have 
superior culture, which by the way has been published, like that literal sentence has been published and due to collective action, we got that retracted. That has been published in the past few years ago. And I'm sure the man is causing trouble somewhere else too. Um, and so, so there's so many things that are layered here um, that are very problematic. And of course, there is absolutely no mention of, um, you know, again, the systemic structural drivers and <clears throat> determinants that result in the accessibility, availability, uh, or even other, um, again, the, the the presence of racial trauma and, and other and, and, and surviving racial and racialized violence that does lead to the higher body mass index at ASCVD race. So none of those things are mentioned. It is on the fault of these minorities, particularly minority women, to just choose, you know, to take care of themselves. And then we need to be quote unquote culturally sensitive. These are very problematic um, conclusions. And again, it requires a specific type of expertise is what we are saying now, so that there is a racism consciousness in the research design and then certainly in the conclusions that are drawn. And so I helped them, I fixed it for them and I and I reframed it as minoritized populations are systemically excluded from opportunities to exercise healthy lifestyle behaviors despite higher BMI and ASCVD risk. In fact, I would add despite being placed at risk for high BMIs and ASCVD. These findings underscore the need for structurally competent recommendations to improve cardiovascular outcomes in populations placed at risk or put at risk for poor health outcomes, particularly minoritized women. It is the structures and the social dynamics and forces, the sociopolitical dynamics and forces that place them at risk that remove and exclude them from the opportunities to participate in their health in the ways they want to. That's the point of intervention. That's the problem, not lo locating the problem in the people themselves. And so as we come as we come to the conclusion of our discussion today, remembering that uh, we, we wanna draw from AFP, AAFP, the American Academy of Family Physicians, who oppose the use of race as a proxy for biology or genetics in clinical evaluation and management and in research, and encourages clinician, clinicians and researchers to investigate alternative indicators to race to stratify medical risk factors for disease states. We draw from the AMA, who adopted policy that recognizes the false conflation of race with inherent biological or genetic traits leads to inadequate examination of true underlying disease risk factors, thereby exacerbating existing health inequities and encourages characterizing race as a social, social construct or sociopolitical construct rather than inherent biological trait, while recognizing that when race is described as a risk factor, it's more likely is a proxy for influences, including structural racism, than a proxy for genetics. So the question is, what is the statement of Wayne Health? What is the statement of Wayne States? What is the statement of the DMC when it comes to race-based medicine? And so we are creating that statement as the End Race-Based Medicine Task Force. And our call to action is to do three things. One, to discontinue and de-adopt race-based medicine in practice teaching and research in our department at Wayne Health at the DMC. And to do that in five identified areas, renal function, EGFR, lung function, PFTs, pul pulmonary function test, cardiovascular disease, and therapeutics, particularly in hypertension. And finally, to evaluate the use and the consequence of pulse oximetry in brown skin patients at our, our uh, institutions. Second call to action is to lead the department uh, Wayne Health and DMC in adoption and institutionalization of racism conscious medicine. And that goes to practice, to, pra to, to policy, to education and supporting our community of practice. And thirdly, to end, to uh, organize and coordinate end race-based medicine symposia and stakeholder roundtables to, 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 to educate and share and learn from our wider community, not just keep it within, but this needs to be um, without. 
And so as a task force, we are going to have to come up with the how we achieve these aims. What is the strategy? Who do we need? Who are the people that we need inside and outside? What resources do we have? What resources do we need? And what deliverables are we going to make? How long are we going to do this for? What is our time timeline and what are the milestones? How will we know when we are successful? What is our plan for evaluation? And so I hope that we will get into discussion. We will sort out our meeting frequency, decide on next steps, including a project charter, which I want to be done quickly, and then move forward. And so with that, I want to thank you for listening. It's been a minute, and I appreciate your time. Um, I, I'm really honored to learn from this sister of mine and work hand in hand with her as co-chair. Um, Dr. Latanya Riddle, want to give her honor and recognize her brilliance in, in contributing to making this happen. Um, you can reach us through these many avenues of social and also by email and y'all have our phone numbers. Um, and we look forward to a fantastic uh, meeting and a fantastic uh, time together as a task force doing just mind-blowingly life-changing, paradigm-shifting things. And so thank you again and wishing you just the best of everything, period. <laughs>